So, um, <clears throat> uh, I'm Rob Farrow, and uh, this paper is co-authored with Joe Akavides. We're both based at the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University. Uh, my background's in philosophy. Uh, I currently work as an educational technologist. Uh, I don't have a background in games research, uh, so if I don't use the sort of terminology that you're familiar with, I hope you'll uh, forgive that. And what I'm going to talk about today is, um, <clears throat> sorry, one sec, uh, what it means to be embodied within a digital environment, um, whether indeed that's possible, uh, <clears throat> and what implications this might have in terms of how to design games. Uh, so my starting point is uh, something that's already been mentioned today, this idea of whole body interaction uh, in terms of control interfaces. So you can see here we have the, um, the familiar Wii Connect and PlayStation Move kind of, uh, I mean, these, this is from advertising, basically. Uh, I think everyone's familiar with this, but the basic idea is that rather than just using a controller or a mouse and a keyboard, uh, you're using more or all of your body to interact with a game. Uh, and you can see from these pictures that part of the idea here is that you feel more immersed or more um, in, inside a game environment by using this. Uh, so human-computer interaction in games is increasingly uh, based on uh, whole body interaction or natural forms of movement. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, one of the drivers behind this is the idea that it makes computer games more accessible. So um, if you don't have to learn special forms of control and you can just use the, the way you normally move within the world, uh, this is something that makes uh, it possible for larger numbers of players and people are maybe from demographics who don't normally play computer games to be involved in them. So here are the, some of the kind of things that this makes possible. Uh, you've got sort of therapeutic uh, uses uh, in the bottom picture this, uh, a guy doing physio physiotherapy. You've got an art installation on the bottom left, uh, various exercise kind of things. Top uh, left, you can put yourself in a game. Um, and we have someone's granddad playing Guitar Hero, uh, kind of getting into it. So uh, you have various kind of innovations coming through uh, to do with how we interact with uh, game environments. You have motion sensors, gesture recognitions, uh, you have voice recognition and facial recognition, and co coming soon uh, are touchless interfaces, so you won't even have to actually touch the, the iPad or the tablet, you just move your hand over it. Uh, so one of my sort of questions here is, is it right to use the language of embodiment here? Uh, some people do, and, and I'm going to try and sort of give some sort of criteria uh, as to when it's appropriate. So here's one... Uh, paper which uses this, this language, uh, Bianchi, Berthaus, Kim and Patel. And they want to say that embodied, embodied interactions uh, are, offer a more natural type of interaction, but more importantly, that they, the, by facilitating a sense of presence within a digital environment, uh, you have a, a stronger experience, a more immersive experience, a more enjoyable experience. Um, now, one way of kind of Framing all of this is to put it in terms of uh, the anti-representational anti turn in philosophy, uh, which uh, I'm going to say is an anti-Cartesian kind of move in philosophy. Uh, you get this in Durish uh, in, with respect to human-computer interaction. Um, one sort of qu quick way of getting to grips with this is through Dreyfus. Dreyfus thinks that uh, we can't get an adequate sense of presence um, in digital environments, and we can't learn properly without an adequate sense of presence. Uh, there does seem to be a sense in which uh, presence within um, a game or a sense of investment within a game makes us care more about the outcomes and it sort of motivates us. Um, so what's at stake, uh, <clears throat> to me anyway, in, in the sense of uh, this discourse about embodiment is twofold. I mean, we have a particular interest in the pedagogical side of this uh, at the Open University. Um, but on the one hand, you have the idea of making better games, so games that are more enjoyable, um, more immersive. And on the other hand, you have this idea that we can actually find ways to learn through games and teach through games. So there's two sort of aspects to this. Uh, the, this idea of um, 
the pedagogical side of it we heard in the last paper yesterday as well. Um, <clears throat> now, I don't really want to go too far into this, um, but it does seem to me that the language around embodiment in the uh, discourse of computer game research is a bit sort of muddled. Um, so sometimes people talk about uh, taking a projective stance, um, the immersiveness uh, of embodiment, embodiment as engagement, as presence. Um, and I would say that these things you know, have quite sort of specific meanings that sometimes get slightly conflated. Uh, I think Bayliss makes a useful distinction between um, being embodied as a state of being and acts which are embodied. And that's something which I'd encourage you to kind of reflect on, but I'm not going to develop that here. Um, Kaliha gives us uh, an analysis which I think I, I can agree with um, about uh, this kind of conflation. Um, he prefers to talk of incorporation, um, which we'll be hearing about in the next session. So I look forward to hearing more about that. So um, to think of some actual examples from games, we've had Half-Life uh, mentioned already. Um, I take this as a kind of exemplary, ex uh, an exemplary example. I take this as an ex example of um, uh, what Don called the uh, embodied perspective. So you have this sense of where I look is where my character looks, and I can see my hands in the game, and I can move around this three-dimensional space. And there are many other examples you could use, Medal of Honor. A lot of these first-person shooters are, are, are similar in the sense of how you feel a sense of embodiment within the game. Um, the recent uh, Zelda game has uh, this a similar, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a third-person perspective on the game, but you get to use the Wii controller like a sword and a shield. Uh, in, and it, I'm, what I'm told is quite an authentic uh, manner. I haven't actually played it myself. Um, but those are all kind of humanoid uh, avatars. So, <clears throat> excuse me. When we have something like uh, Akami, where the avatar is a, a wolf, how do we kind of relate to that um, being? Is it in the same way? I mean, I don't have four legs, so uh, do I get a sense of my, my embodiment changing or not being consistent with that? Uh, in Res, the avatar is this kind of, well, what is it? It's the avatar of an avatar, um, tr just traveling through this cyberspace and kind of you know, interacting with well, uh, at, at quite abstract representations of computer viruses. Um, you might still find yourself dodging bullets, as it were. Can you really feel you know, as embodied with an avatar like this as you would with a, a, a recognizably human avatar? In Flower, the avatar is kind of not there. You never actually see the avatar of Flower. You see the effect of the breath of wind. You can see the, the petals move, but you never actually see the wind which is kind of true uh, of real life anyway, but you can feel wind. You can't feel the wind in flower. Um, do we still want to talk about embodiment in, in a case like that? I'm not really so sure about that. Um, so I would say that talk about embodiment is more plausible in some cases than others. Um, I think we have two sort of broad categories. One is 3D games with avatars, and I would include first-person perspectives there. Um, and the other is sort of virtual reality. There was a lot of um, research in virtual reality in the 90s. It's kind of died off, it seems to me. Um, a lot of the researchers working at that time also used Merleau-Ponty, uh, which is the philosopher, I, or who is the philosopher I intend to use to kind of um, offer some criteria for embodiment. Um, so uh, I suppose one way of framing all this is what are the limits to embodiment within the digital world and how can we kind of investigate that? So um, I'm going to develop this with reference to Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology of perception. And I have three, uh, are they criteria? Maybe they're not quite criteria. Certainly sort of thematic um, points of interest or points of reference that I think uh, we could use to develop a theory of embodiment. Um, and I'll say more about these in a second. <clears throat> so, one question is, why Merle Alponti? Um, simple answer is, you said embodiment, right? So, we go to Merle Alponti. Um, it's the most sustained uh, treatment of embodiment um, in the phenomenological tradition that I'm aware of. Um, but the, one of the main points about it is, 
Uh, Merleau-Ponty really emphasizes the centrality of the body for um, human experience. And again, you could put this in the context of the anti-Cartesian kind of phenomenological movement. So, the first, first of my criteria. Um, touchant touché, or touching and being touched. Uh, now, for Merleau-Ponty, there's this idea that um, part of uh, what it means to be embodied is to have this kind of primordial sense of touch and experience of the world. Um, and you can't touch without simultaneously having the experience of being touched, in the sense that touch is a reflexive capacity. Now, um, one thing that you'll find with all computer games, um, as far as I'm aware, is that you'll never have a truly reflexive sense of touch within a game. It's always limited. Um, and that's partly the nature of just, you know, how you control a computer game. Um, maybe one day we'll have, <coughs> excuse me, technologies which give us a better sense of what it might be to be, t to be touched within a game. Um, there is some work being done with holograms and puffs of air, where you can sort of stand in this uh, physical space and holographic bubbles fall down. And as you swap them, you actually feel some resistance because they have a sort of air behind them, even though they're not really there, as it were. Um, but one thing I'd like to sort of uh, take from this, this idea of touching and being touched is this, this idea that there's something asymmetrical about our relationship to this digital kind of world. Um, the avatar never has um, an adequate sort of sense of embodiment, in that sense at least. Um, what I'm calling virtual polymorphism, we had uh, discussed in the previous paper as um, prosthesis. Um, Merleau-Ponty gives us a way of describing how the phenomenal body extends beyond the physical body. So the limits of my phenomenal body are not the same as the limits of my physical body. So um, prosthetics are one example. Um, spectacles might be another, or a car. You know, when, when someone drives a car, they have a sense of where the limits of that car are. Uh, in, it becomes intuitive. It's not something that you have to represent anymore. It's more immediate. Um, now, um, one way of looking at whole body interaction or mimetic sort of game interfaces is to say they're actually trying to give you the sense that, uh, that your phenomenological body extends beyond your physical body in a certain way. And normally with something like prosthetics, you would expect there to be a, a long period of time before something becomes successfully incorporated into your bodily image. Um, I, I would say that you could see um, this trend towards whole body, whole body interaction and towards haptic feedback and so on as a way of kind of uh, convincing us that our phenomenological, our phenomenal body is, not, is, extent, is manifested in a particular way. Um, now, uh, one thing I'd like to kind of draw attention to in re with respect to this is whether we talk about uh, games being embodied experiences or not. And in some uh, research, and uh, I'm sort of picking on Crick here, uh, people like to say because you're traversing this 3D environment that sort of uh, has this sort of constant uh, uh, sort of flow of you know, the perception is there that uh, it's a consistent 3D world that you're kind of moving around within. We can call that an embodied experience. Uh, it's, uh, and I would want to say actually no. Um, all experience is embodied anyway. Right? You're always using all of your body anyway, whether you're consciously aware of it or not. Um, sitting on your sofa with a controller in your hand is still a form of whole body interaction in the sense that all human activity is embodied in that way. Um, the implied distinction between embodied and cerebral experiences is, to my mind, is spurious. And um, I would kind of prefer to get away from that way of, of looking at things. Um, the third criteria that I want to kind of draw attention to is, I suppose, an existential one. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at it in terms of intersubjective life worlds. 
So the idea here is that whenever we perceive something or whenever we act, we're already bound up with a certain kind of existential condition and a certain kind of interpretation of the world. Um, so any, any meaningful sense of embodiment is going to be bound up with a practical context. At the same time, embodiment itself is also a source of meaning. Um, so depending on how you're embodied and what kind of body you have, um, meaning is already in that, in the world, as it were, in, in embodiment. So, uh, so one way of thinking about what it means to be embodied is to sort of think about it in terms of whether you have something meaningful, intrinsically meaningful, going on. Uh, as much fun as Tetris is, I would say there's no real meaning to destroying these blocks, right? It's just something that kind of, you know, you do it because that's what the game is. Um, and I'm, I'm going to give some examples in, in a second of games that I think m might be considered meaningful in their, on their own terms in, in a different sense. I mean, one way, uh, one, one example might be L.A. Noir in the sense that uh, mainly through the delivery, uh, the presentation of the game, there's a sense of it mattering, something at stake in these mysteries. Um, I think Heavy Rain is maybe my favourite example for, for illustrating this kind of idea. If you've played the game, you might recognise this scene with all the crucifixes uh, going on. There are other ones you could pick in Heavy Rain for uh, where you feel like you have to make a choice that's meaningful. Um, in this case, uh, you play uh, a police investigator who's uh, hunting down someone who's a, suspect, a suspected serial killer. And, um, yeah, there's a moment where you have to make a decision uh, as to whether uh, you think this guy's going for his gun or, or not. And uh, it can take you by surprise. And what, what you do in that moment has implications for the rest of the game. Um, there's also something to be said about uh, the uh, sense of sort of, I suppose it's a moral importance in terms of what you do in that game. I mean, you might know that obviously there's no more meaning to uh, saving a, an avatar uh, from dying than there is in destroying blocks in Tetris. It's how successfully the illusion can uh, convince us that there's meaning, meaning there. Uh, I think also Heavy Rain has something interesting going on in terms of the control system where what you're doing with your body is, that is also uh, emulating what the character is doing. So there's a fairly grisly scene where the father of the child who's been abducted has to uh, cut off a finger, I think it is. Um, and you have to kind of mimic the movements in order to do that. And it feels fairly, you know, uncomfortable in a sense. Um, I, Mass Effect 2 does quite a good job of giving, or well, portraying a convincing world where there are cultures that seem to matter and have their own agendas, well-rounded characters. I mean, this is partly about good writing, I think. Um, but also a sense of choice. So you can go different ways in the game. If your companions die, they're really dead, right? They don't come back. Um, and choices that you make in the first game can have implications in the third game, which is um, you know, many hours of gameplay later. And that sense of things mattering, I think, is also um, r related to a convincing sense of embodiment. So, oops, Skyrim. Now, uh, Skyrim might seem, on the face of it, uh, to be a good contender for this sense of embodiment, because you have this, first of all, this ability to kind of traverse a very large, expansive world in three dimensions. Um, you can customize your character to a, quite a degree. Um, you can have lots of uh, different kinds of interactions with people. To some extent, you can you know, make meaningful choices, so less so, I would say, than the other examples. Um, here's, uh, this is from a, rev a review of Skyrim, um, and it refers to a fort that you can enter near the start of the game where uh, bandits have taken over, and they've uh, basically enslaved this woman to be their kind of housemaid and cook for them and so on. And the player can kill all the bandits and rescue her, but she just still stand, hangs around the fort and says, oh, well, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm just here to cook and clean. Um, and so the illusion of this meaningful world is lost because uh, this character is behaving in quite a sort of unrealistic way. Um, that's something that you find quite a lot in Skyrim, actually, for all its kind of impressive qualities. So in a way, this is, I suppose, it's, it's sort of failing to meet this criteria. Um, now, I haven't played Dark Souls, but I thought this was quite an interesting um, description of the game from, this is from Edge. Um, 
Dark Souls profoundly understands online play's defining feature, uh, humanity. And it talks about the importance of the sort of online and multiplayer aspects of, of the game. Um, I, and again, here I suppose there's a sense of it, you know, trying to convey something meaningful about what you're doing. Um, I'm not really a big fan of um, uh, online gaming. I, I don't tend to do it that much. Um, I'm sure some of you might say, you know, in the questions that there's something about online gaming which is kind of meaningful or intersubjective. We can have that conversation. Um, but with Dark Souls, uh, there does seem to be this sense of um, what you do in the game mattering and how you communicate with others mattering. Um, and I think that's, if you like, uh, something people who talk about embodiment they tend to focus on the interaction and the relationship between the player and the world. I suppose I'm trying to sort of suggest that the world itself is something that lends us towards a convincing sense of embodiment. Um, Shadow of the Colossus, I don't have that much to say about it other than that there is, you know, not really much meaning as such. Uh, in this, why are you doing what you're doing in Shadow of the Colossus? Certainly at the start of the game, you have no real reason to do anything. You know, there's no real reason to kill these colossi, as it were. Um, everything is implied. And um, there's nothing really explicit about the way that you kind of orientate yourself in that game. Um, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so, to conclude, uh, one thing I want to say is that using more of the body in, in terms of control interfaces is not the same thing as promoting embodiment. Um, so, we need a sort of an improved phenomenological account of what it means to feel a sense of embodiment. Um, I think this non-reflexive sense of touch is quite important, and I would like to kind of spend more time thinking about that, I think. Um, I think creating a convincing and meaningful world is quite important, and uh, a sense of meaningful choices uh, and even responsibilities. Um, one thing that I think is often kind of lost in the discourse around um, embodied gaming is that they're always secondary digital forms of embodiment. They're never going to be the same as um, what, you know, your, your originary or primordial sense of embodiment. Um, maybe that goes without saying, but I don't, I don't sort of get a sense of it sometimes from some of the research that I've read. Um, And I think this maybe also goes without saying, the idea that phenomenological descriptions can inform game design and potentially uh, virtual learning environment design. Um, and I think I agree with Don in the sense that uh, it's not necessarily an empirical question um, in the sense that we don't have to do necessarily do science to find out the answer to this. There is a value for, for phenomenological description in, um, in approaching these kinds of questions. So uh, there's my email and my website, and my co-author's email and website. Uh, please do get in touch if you have any questions. And uh, thanks for listening. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> I wonder if there are any questions. There is one in the back. get used to this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you seem to think uh, that Merleau-Ponty is the right way to go with this. That what is, sorry? Merleau-Ponty. Merleau-Ponty. Is, is the right way to approach this problem. Uh, at least that's a phenom phenomenologist that you mentioned. I'm wondering, uh, uh, have you read any of Sean Gallagher's work? I can't say I have. Okay. Um, because, because I think he's, he's one of the, the, well, living phenomenologists that, that used the Merleau-Pontyan line instead of the well, Husserlian and Heideggerian and whatever kind of, an, and um, the reason why I'm mentioning it is of course also a shameless plug of the uh, article that uh, uh, myself and Torben wrote because that's the, well, I'm sorry that I used the mirror neurons in that article because <laughs> what I wanted to convey was actually the kind of account that you're asking for here is that, that Sean's or Mr. Gallagher's approach is to sort of analyze this uh, 
relationship between agency and ownership and sort of real bodies and represented bodies and that's what we're working with in that and sort of using both higher order intentions, lower order intentions, um, efferent motor commands and efferent feedback and coupling that to isomorphic uh, movements and representations. So there's actually a framework to analyze a lot of what what you're saying here in that article, if you're interested. Yeah, that is very interesting. Um, and I'd like to talk to you more about that. Sure. Let's do that. OK. <laughs> Any more? No one's going to mention Warcraft. No? It's a good job. Can we take touch as a metaphor instead well, of being... It touch depends touch. what you're taking it as a metaphor for. I'm, I'm asking you, <laughs> what, what could it be a metaphor for? Well, I don't for? know. I mean, uh, could it be a metaphor? Well, anything can be a metaphor. Uh, do you have something specific in mind about touch? Or? I mean, if you take touch as the, uh, call it the yardstick or call it the baseline that needs to be established, I mean... To as feel far it, as to I be see, embodied. Yes, so yeah. our games to... Games are on the screens, and we are on this side of the screen. And it's not likely that it's going to be established anytime soon. So if there is a workaround for touch, maybe that's what I'm asking. Mm. Well, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, the position that I'm inclined to at the moment is that there's just something fundamentally and irreducibly asymmetrical about that in a digital environment. Um, so I would say probably not. Um, because uh, what, you, what you won't have in a digital environment is a primordial sense of embodiment. It will only be derivative. So your primordial sense of embodiment is non-digital. Um, and touch is part of a prim the primordial experience of embodiment. Because you mentioned, mentioned touch, I started to think of other senses. We have a sense of acceleration. We have a sense of where our body is in relation to itself. You could say that we won't get embodied action unless we have those as well. And it's kind of, then we'll really have a problem ever getting it. Would you say that this is something we can get better at? Or are there, is there some point we can't? go beyond? Well, um, I mean, I don't think I'm very well qualified to answer that question. What I would, the way I would sort of answer that would really be to say, look, it's not really about um, the answer to that question. It's more about trying to get people who write about this and talk about this to sort of get a clearer framework for the way that they talk about it. So I, th I agree with you, really, in the sense of, you know, there are limits to this. Um, I'm really just trying to firstly get people to acknowledge what, that there are limits and secondly to try and discover where are those limits. I don't want to steal the question, I just want to quickly no, um, notice or maybe bring into discussion about touch. I think that Eco, actually, the prequel to Shadow of Ecolossus, is, is about that. I mean, the theme of the game is about touching. I mean, you have this girl that you have in this maze game to bring through this castle, and all the time when you hold her on your hand, the controller is vibrating. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't agree with your statement on Shadow of Ecolossus that you don't have a meaning to act, to, to, to find this Colossus. I think it's working this game very, very well, actually, that you have only this very fragment in the beginning of like, you are on an epic journey, you don't know where you're coming from, you don't know where you're going, but you have to like bring this woman to life, which is lying there, it's like um, Snow White. Um, like, yeah. Sure, I, I think, you know, I probably, I probably misspoke slowly. I wasn't really meaning to say that they had no meaning, but the meaning is implied rather than explicit, because it's a silent game really, you know, there's not much kind of to frame what you're doing, you just get a sense of, okay, I'm supposed to do this. But it's all implied rather than explicit. So, but yeah, I think I'll probably just take that one out and put an ICO slide in instead. No, 
No, I just wanted to um, just wanted to comment on that thing about the touching be touched as well, because it brings me back to the times when, in the beginning of the 90s, we were working with virtual reality and all these fantasies of cyber sex with these prothesis that you put on and things. So. Um, I, I think the role of imagination is extremely important in this, whether you call it subjectivity, imagination, or simulation, even uh, mental simulation. I think it's, uh, this is a very important thing to, 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 to main, maintain a distinction in that respect. That was I only agree. a comment. I agree. I also just wanted to make a quick comment on this. Uh, just, um, I think also, all in all in computer games, it's like, uh, I think it's more an abstract form or different way of feeling this, whatever uh, embodiment touched or whatever. And exact, that's, that's the main uh, feature of it actually, like that's something completely different, that you're feeling this uh, new and different feeling of engagement that only gives you, yeah, that's the, and so it's not, you don't want to feel the punch in the, in the boxing fight sure. or something. And you don't want to die or feel pain and yeah. these kind of things. Yeah, and, uh, but of course you want to feel something, you want to feel something. Uh, you want mild peril. But something new, something strange, that is kind of, uh, yeah, I just wanted to stress on that. Thank you. Thanks, Rob, for the talk. Uh, Thank you very we much. Have, uh, <coughs> Gordon's keynote in 15 minutes, but let, let us have a break first. Thank you.